Welcome to One Healthy World brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, right here in Washington, D.C., and joined, as always, by my friend from across the pond, Dr. Gemma Newman. Dr. Newman, good to see you again. Good to see you, Chuck. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Now, I am just like so many other people, Dr. Newman, when it comes to losing weight, trying to keep it off, or even just figuring out what's the healthiest way to eat. You Google that and you're going to get bombarded with about 18 and 1 million different diets, all claiming to be number one tippy top. And so today, what I would love to do is take some time to look at all of these different diets so we can kind of decide what actually is the healthiest. You are in the medical profession, and I know you probably know about all 18 million of those and then at least another half dozen or so. How do we <laughs> even begin to compare diets, you know? I know. It's a real minefield out there, especially when you're looking at magazines and on social media. Uh, one minute it's keto, next minute it's blood type, and then the next minute it's, it's a carnivore, and then it's something else. And yeah, it can get really confusing for people, but what I always try and bring it back to is an understanding of the general consensus when it comes to the science. And when we look at all the data over decades, um, spanning mechanistic as well as epidemiological, what we begin to discover is, of course, that having a minimally processed and maximally filled with plants diet is really going to be uh, the way forward for the majority of people in their health journey. So, you know, talking loads about fruits and veggies and whole grains and legumes and herbs and spices and nuts and seeds, uh, these are going to be a fantastic cornerstone of one of the most health giving diets out there. And unfortunately, that's not so sexy when it comes to, you know, making numbers on social media, right, Chuck? Oh, no doubt about it. Um, <laughs> sometimes the truth hurts. And in a lot of cases, that, that means your social media numbers. Um, but you know what? Let's be purveyors of truth nonetheless. Um, I'm curious before we bring on our, 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 our easy for me to say, all-star panel of guests, um, I'm, I want to hear more about your practice and how you incorporate a lot of what it is we're going to be talking about today into the conversations you're having with your patients. Yeah, I do try and talk about this with almost everyone I see. And of course, it's a bit of a surprise to them sometimes because they don't always come to see me with diet in mind. Uh, I see people from cradle to grave with every kind of problem. And what I really find most helpful is actually listening to them to start with. We've got to listen to what people come in with before we can even talk about diet. And chances are a lot of the things that they are coming in with do have some form of dietary component that may improve things, um, as well as other lifestyle and holistic measures. So that's all the things that I'm about. I love listening to my patients, figuring out some of the root causes of why they're struggling, and then asking them where they feel they can make a start. And chances are with most people, what I've discovered over the years is that food is often one of those easier entry points into habit change uh, because it feels so tangible to them, perhaps more so than reducing stress because that looks very different for every single different person but you know when it comes to dietary strategies it can be something that is often a shoe in to other habits so yeah i tend to start with that if they're interested and i know that that's also something that you covered extensively in your book as well the plant power doctor i mean this is at the heart of what's in in your book correct Oh, absolutely. In fact, you know what? I have a copy right here, funnily enough. If you can see there that. it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as if you're going to ask me that question. No, um, I love my book, The Plant Power Doctor, because it's what I would say to my patients if I had more than 10 minutes. And luckily, I've built a lovely community. I've got 3000 patients that I look after uh, and I get the opportunity to see them over and over and again, um, encourage them, support them. Um, but often 10 minutes is just not enough to get the message across. So I wrote the book with my patients in mind. There are chapters for heart disease, cancer, um, plant-based eating for all ages, um, skin health, hormone health, uh, you name it, it's in there and the recipes to go with it. So it's like one of those one-stop shops for people who want to make some changes. 
All right, so check this out. Um, obviously, diet confusion is a global epidemic, and that's why we do One Healthy World. So we said all-star panel of guests. See, I got it right that time. All-star panel of guests. And we really are going to span the globe in a big, big way today. Uh, number one, we're going to be jolting off to Canada, Vancouver. We're going to be speaking with Dr. Matthew Nagra. He's going to be here today. Um, he's going to be talking with us about the keto diet and maybe some problems that may come from that. Um, then we're going to take a, a turn down to Washington, D.C. We're going to speak with Dr. Neil Barnard in just a second about the Mediterranean diet. Um, but I think, Dr. Newman, um, maybe who I am most excited about today, no offense to the other two phenomenal doctors, uh, but is Dr. Daniel Ganu, who is from Kenya. And get this, for more than two decades, he lived with crippling arthritis. And I'm sure that he also tried a number of different diets until he stumbled across the one that was really able to bring that arthritis under control. Can you imagine 20 years living with something that's just ruining your quality of life? That doesn't sound like a lot of fun at all. No, I can't imagine that. And I think it's wonderful to be able to hear stories like this because it's so inspiring for um, our listeners to know that um, you know, even when you're suffering from something for a long time, dietary uh, interventions can sometimes make a huge difference. And don't forget, we've got Dr. Megan Rossi joining us as well. She's going to also be talking to us about um, blood type diets, and she is a foremost international expert on gut health. Uh, so she's going to be a wonderful guest. I can't wait for her to join us as well. We've got a jam packed day. And of course, our own culinary whiz, uh, our insider in the kitchen, Anne Christine, is also here. She's going to be taking a closer look at what she calls cookie diets. Uh, man, you know, the kookiest I ever did was the cookie diet. And that one just did not work very well either. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, the, the cookie oh diet goodness. is a very real thing. And I'm here to tell you today that eating cookies does not help you lose weight. Shocker. Um, but let's <laughs> let's start with, uh, I want to do a head-to-head -head comparison, and I want to welcome Dr. Neil Barnard to the show for this one. Um, a lot of people, Dr. Barnard, talk about the Mediterranean diet as being the holy grail of healthy eating. Um, here, we skew more toward a very exclusive plant-based diet. So when you're looking at the two head-to-head, -head, what does the data show in terms of what the better option might be? Yeah, let me give you some background on that. But first, hi, Chuck, and hi, Gemma. Hi. It's great to be with you today. So good. Great to be with you, with you today. You know, the, the whole idea of this Mediterranean diet, it's so popular, not necessarily because it works or, or whatever, but it just sounds so nice. You know, I'll be on the coast of Tuscany at sunset, having a glass of red wine over a plate of linguine. You know, how could that be bad? So I think when people talk about Mediterranean diet, they don't necessarily know what it actually means. Um, and they don't really know how it stacks up against other diets. Our team actually did that exact study. This is the, uh, the publication in the Journal of the American College of Nutrition. We brought in 62 people. They were all overweight. They wanted to lose weight. Half of them began the Mediterranean diet. The other half started a vegan diet. 16 weeks later, they stopped the diet and switched to the opposite. So the Mediterranean people now started vegan. The vegan people now started Mediterranean. And along the way, everybody met every week with a dietitian who actually followed and believed in the respective diet. So one was Mediterranean, one was vegan. Everybody got a lot of support. Here's what we found. At the beginning of the study, the Mediterranean people were happy to have this kind of indulgent seeming diet. But then as the time went by, their weight didn't really drop very much. The vegan group, they thought, oh my goodness sakes, is this going to be difficult? They ended up finding it really easy and the weight just came off. 16 weeks later, everybody stopped and they went back to their old way of eating for four weeks. Then they started the opposite diet. And the people who had been Mediterranean and now were going vegan, suddenly the weight started coming off when they were on the plant-based diet. But the opposite was true. The people who had been following a vegan diet and now started the Mediterranean diet, they started to complain because the weight was coming back on. And they also said, you know, we've been vegan for 16 weeks. We don't miss the chicken wings and, you know, uh, cheese and that kind of stuff. We don't want that anymore. And we, we really want to stick with our healthy vegan diet. And for research, they had to do the Mediterranean diet for 16 weeks. They couldn't wait to go back to vegan. That, there you have it. 
Now, Dr. Barnard, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, with a Mediterranean diet, the, the fat content there is a little bit higher because I do believe that it puts a premium on uh, fish and nuts, both of which have a little bit uh, higher fat um, and, and calorie content than an exclusively whole food plant-based diet. How much of a role do you think that plays in what you saw with the weight loss? Fat, yeah, fat comes into it everywhere. There's some fish in the diet and they'll say, have fatty fish. Well, that salmon is 40% fat. If it's Chinook salmon, it's 50% fat as a percentage of its, its calories. There's some eggs, there's some meat, maybe not as much as before, but it's nowhere near as low in fat as, the, as a healthy plant-based diet. So within the studies on Mediterranean diets, though, people have sometimes looked at those people who go a little further and really do the Mediterranean kind of cuisine, vegan style. What I mean is, instead of chicken, they have the chickpeas. You know, you can, you can be in a Mediterranean country eating all the wonderful foods there, leave off the animal products, you got the best of both worlds. I think it's also a really important point to talk about international um, diets and the ways that people find comfort through foods that they've grown up with for a long time. Because although there's been a lot of research on the benefits of a Mediterranean diet, we can't deny that there is some fabulous research out there on them. People are not all eating Mediterranean diets. You know, people have diets from all over the world um, that can also be tremendously healthy and health giving. That will also still include a huge amount of plants, fruits, vegetables, whole grains and legumes. So I think it's actually really important to you know, talk about healthy living and what it means for people from you know, from from Alaska to to Ghana. Like, there's very different styles of eating and they're not all going to want to eat a Mediterranean diet. <laughs> That is exactly true. You know, every culture has its its culinary jewels, uh, their own vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans. And when we remember the power that those have and put them into really delicious recipes, all the health benefits come out too. Mm. Absolutely. I wish that we had more time. I feel like there's so much more that we could get into here, Dr. Barnard. Um, but let's uh, let's go ahead and put a pin in this for now. And let's revisit this in a future episode, because I know that there's a heck of a lot more research out there on Mediterranean diets that I think that our audience would love to hear. Um, and we will speak with you again in just a little bit. But Dr. Newman, let's uh, grab our passports now and head over to Canada, where we are joined by our friend, Dr. Matthew Nagra, who is an expert on the keto diet. Now, Dr. Nagra, uh, I have 99 problems. If I'm eating the keto diet, is that one? I mean, it could be. And that largely also depends on the way that it's done. So if we look at the, the traditional keto diet, it's usually going to be very high in animal fat and therefore saturated fat. Um, it's not always going to be nutritionally adequate. And in fact, the keto diet was, was traditionally used in medicine to treat what's called intractable epilepsy. So these are cases of epilepsy that just aren't responding to medication. And if you have, say, children who are suffering from seizures on a regular basis and you have a way to control that, that could be worth the risk of things like high risk of fracture, kidney stones, and you know GI discomfort and that sort of thing. But... That's not how people are typically doing it or not why people are typically doing it. They're typically doing it because they want, you know, these proposed weight loss benefits. They want perhaps athletic benefits, not that the research really backs that up anyway. And we're typically seeing healthy individuals adopting these diets, right? Now, there was a study done in Sweden just a little over a year ago where they took healthy young women who um, were all in the kind of normal weight category, had great blood sugar levels to begin with, and they put them on a keto diet or the Swedish guidelines, which is very similar to the American or Canadian guidelines, for four weeks each. The keto group saw on average a 1.8 millimole per liter or 70 milligram per deciliter jump in their LDL cholesterol. So to put that into perspective, the healthy ideal level of LDL cholesterol is 1.8 millimoles per liter or 70 milligrams per deciliter. They were already a little above that to begin with, and then almost doubled it to levels that would be dangerous if maintained long term for cardiovascular risk. Um, and you know that's unfortunately what we're seeing in a lot of the you know anecdotes that are posted around the carnivore diet or keto dieters online. I'm always seeing these really scary values out there that sure in the short term you might not see a problem with, but, you know, 5, 10, 15 years down the road could be causing a heart attack. 
Yeah. And so that is really one of my biggest concerns. I think you're right there, Matthew. And I'm so glad you brought that up because that's something that I've been really worried about with my patients because people forget that our number one killer in the Western world is heart disease. And so if we're going to be having a way of eating that is actually, you know, causing us to have a demonstrable rise in the one risk factor that we know is directly linked to heart disease risk, then we've got something that we're really worrying about there. And I think what might be helpful for our listeners is a bit more of an understanding of what even is ketogenic diets, because my understanding that is that people who have a low carb diet, for example, quite often, they're not even going into ketosis, they just think that they are. So so what does it really actually mean? Yeah, so a ketogenic diet is designed to um, turn your body into a essentially fat burner as opposed to a carb burner. So you're reducing your carbohydrate intake so low that you actually don't have enough carbohydrates to really fuel your body and fuel your brain. So you start to have fats being broken down in your liver into what are called ketones that actually can cross into the brain and, and fuel your brain to a degree. But again, that does come with those potential other issues, especially if it is super high in the animal fats. Um, and with the whole idea of ketos fueling the brain, that's where a lot of the other claims around cognitive function and, and whatnot come from, but there just really isn't good data to back that up. And we do have good data on plant centric dietary patterns, improving cognitive function. In fact, we have good data on like berries, for example, which do have carbohydrates being a, a good source uh, for cognitive function as well. Well, I, you know, I just, it's funny, we, we talk about all of this misinformation, and I, I know that that's something, uh, Dr. Nagar, that you really specialize in. I mean, you're a naturopathic doctor who really prides himself in presenting evidence-based nutrition information uh, to your patients. Just from the kind of lay perspective here for us, like, how do we go about combating this, this misinformation that's out there? I feel like the drum gets beaten for a diet like keto, and it just gets banged louder and louder and louder and louder. And pretty soon the noise is deafening. So everybody assumes that this is a really healthy option. How could the lay person go about combating that with what we do know to be, it's probably not the healthiest option for you? Yeah, that's really challenging. And I think there are a few things people can look for to really gauge if the source of information they're going to is, is you know, legitimate or, or solid. And that's for one, do they even provide references in the first place? I can't tell you how many times I've seen posts on social media where they don't provide anything. And, and so that that's a bit of a red flag. Second is, are they looking at research on like rats or pigs? Or are they actually looking at human data? Like that's a huge red flag because Animal research doesn't translate into human outcomes very often. And I know that's something that uh, PCRM has spoken about when it comes to animal testing. And then the other thing is, is it corroborated by other evidence? Like, is this something that's reflected in dietary guidelines? Is it something that you're seeing from multiple reputable sources? Or is it just this one individual who supposedly has the hack, you know, that, that nobody else has figured out yet? Those all, to me, scream red flags. And those would be things that I would be uh, maybe taking a step back from it and, and reaching out to other sources to maybe confirm or, or rebut. There you go. Hey, look, you know, what's not a red flag is your Instagram account. What is your handle if somebody <laughs> wants to give you a follow? Yeah, at uh, Dr. Matthew Niagara, so that's Dr. Matthew Niagara. All right. If I had a green flag, I'd be waving that as in go. Go give this a follow right now. It is just a phenomenal account. Absolutely one of my favorites. Thanks so much for being here, my friend. And thanks for having me. It's always good to connect with you guys. Dr. Newman, you ready to have some fun here? I think that Anne Christine, our culinary whiz, is just going to dial up something spectacular here because uh, there are some cookie diets out there. I mentioned the cookie diet a little bit earlier. What's the craziest one you've heard of? Um, I think probably the grape diet. Um, <laughs> where you the just grape eat grapes. What is the grape <laughs> diet? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, well, it, it is what it says on the tin. You just eat grapes. I mean, it's not a good idea, clearly. It's um, although it's got a lot of water and it's got a lot of um, resveratrol. If you're eating red grapes, <laughs> you're not going to get the right nutrition, clearly. So, yeah, there's a lot of kooky diets out there. Um, I think, t to be honest, one of the ones that really bothers me the most is the carnivore diet because you know, like Matthew was just saying earlier, we, we've got to consider our long-term health. We've got to consider our, our risk factors for heart disease. And that one is a heart attack waiting to happen. Um, and in fact, I've had one patient in particular that I'm thinking of who 
massively increased his cholesterol after trying it and you know it, it worries me to the core so yeah some of them are fun and some of them are dangerous let's see what mm. she's got to say <laughs> mm. i'm curious did did, did uh, the patient who uh really saw that spike in cholesterol did they kind of revert back to a healthier way of eating after a while yeah, they got qu quite constipated, and after a discussion <laughs> with me, they decided that they would they would uh, give more plants a try. Um, thankfully, so they did manage to bring their levels down. Um, but yeah, it's definitely not without its risks. There you go. All right. Well, let's see what uh, Anne Christine has dialed up for us today when it comes to cookie diets. Are you overwhelmed by all the diets and weight loss tactics out there? It seems like there are a million different diets and strategies, and some of them are pretty out there. Ta Hello, it's Anne from Veggie Manifique, your go-to for holistic wellness and a healthy vegan lifestyle. And today, we're going to be looking at some of those far out and interesting weight loss tactics. First up is the cabbage soup diet. So as it sounds, you'll be eating cabbage soup. Now, if you only eat cabbage soup, chances are you, you will lose weight. But how sustainable is that? Could you eat cabbage soup for the rest of time? So clearly, this is a short-term diet. Next up is the Slim Fast Diet. The Slim Fast Diet replaces real food with essentially shakes and bars. Now, you may slim fast, but suppose you wanted to eat something else than a bar or a shake. Tricky. So with this setup, you would maybe slim fast and then regain fast. Furthermore, their shakes have been known to contain these ingredients. Fat-free milk, sugar, and canola oil. Hmm. The next one is the Ducan diet, which is a French one. Now, during the first phase of the Ducan diet, you remove pretty much everything except for animal proteins. So again, you may lose weight temporarily, but it kind of sounds like a lack of fiber, which screams of constipation. Next up is the tapeworm diet. Now, I kid you not here, this, this is a thing. So the idea here is that you swallow a capsule that has a tapeworm egg in it, and it goes into your stomach, and it hatches, and then the tapeworm eats all of your extra calories. So I'm wondering, like, how, how often do you eat tapeworms? Like, do you, does, do you just let that one camp out there, you know, rent-free for a while, or? The next diet is the blood type diet. Want to know what to eat? The answer is supposedly in your blood. Of course, this is not based on real science. Can I eat this apple? Next up is the Paris diet, which consists of cigarettes, coffee, diet soda, and then just eating dinner. I smoke a cigarette, and then if I am hungry, I'm going to, to take a coffee. Later, maybe uh, sometime, I take a coca light, and then I eat the dinner. And I am I'm skinny. Huh? Now, you, you may lose weight, but you may also keel over at the age of 45. But c'est la vie. Next up is weight loss pills or drinks. Magical pills or drinks that promise you will lose weight regardless of what you eat. Hmm, you think maybe it could be too good to be true? But what if the answer wasn't another diet? And instead, something more permanent, abundant, and delicious. What if we just ate the rainbow? A power plate? of juicy fruits, vegetables, whole grains and legumes, and nuts and seeds. It's no secret. Eating a whole food plant-based diet isn't a diet, it's a lifestyle. And when we transition to this way of life, everyone wins. Because on the long term, not only does it help us to have a healthy weight, but it also helps us to prevent disease, feel our best, and be gentle on our planet. So you can put down the tapeworm egg. Isn't life delicious? Kooky indeed. And Christine, she just does not disappoint. Appreciate that so very much. I want to get serious though for a moment and introduce you to a gentleman who perhaps touched me in a more profound way than anyone over the course of my time hosting the exam room and now helping out here with One Healthy World as well. Uh, Dr. Daniel Gnu met him in August at the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine in Washington, D.C. He had flown all the way from his home in Kenya to be at the conference, not just to learn, but to say thank you, because it turns out that watching an episode of The Exam Room was just the launching point 
for turning around a 20-year battle with rheumatoid arthritis. My friend, I am so honored that you are here with us today from your home in Kenya, really bringing that global feel to One Healthy World. It is great to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you also. 20 years you had rheumatoid arthritis. How bad did it get? Thank you, Chuck, for the question. And uh, I'm so glad to be with you once again, even though through um, electronic system. Um, my journey started in the year 2000 when I developed this severe form of rheumatoid arthritis. This disease became so much worse that I was put on several medications and including steroid and, and painkillers and all these things. The disease showed no sign of slowing down. Um, the pain became so unbearable. And I also started seeing the side effect of all the medications that I was put on. Eventually, I was diagnosed of lupus, systemic lupus. Um, and and, and, and it, the disease continued and different, you know, deformity came in. Uh, my hand began to, you know, deform. Uh, and so, like you rightly said, uh, last year, um, my wife and I would never, I, I can't say my story without bringing in my wife because she was very much concerned about my condition and she was always searching in the net and she chanced on your interview with uh, Monica Agawa. And then she ran to me and said, I found the solution. You know, we had tried many things. My rheumatologist even told me that I should be on fish because I am getting anemic all the time. And he recommended that I shouldn't stop eating fish. And, um, mm. and so, you know, she came to me with the interview, uh, your interview with Monica, and I listened. And so in October 2021, I started the plant-based diet, but not totally. Somehow, because of what my rheumatologist told me, I used to bring in fish once in a while. But January this year, I switched completely to plant-based diet completely and and chalk believe me or not four months into my plants based based diet the pain began to diminish i was off most of those medication methotrexate i was on six tablets per week and i reduced it to four and i had gone off all other medication that was a great motivation for me and i continued as I am speaking right now, Chuck, um, I have reduced my methotrexate to three per week. That is the only medicine. The pains are all gone. I, I saw my life wasting away. My energy was depleting. I wasn't productive anymore. But now I am back. I have bounced back fully. And thank God to plant-based diet. And thank God to the session committee for what you have done. And and we are grateful for you for sharing that story. I, I don't want to gloss over the fact that your quality of life had deteriorated to the point where just lifting a piece of paper for you at one point yes. was excruciating. Describe beyond just excruciating, describe what that experience was like and how that was truly limiting your quality of life at the time. You know, like I said, my energy was depleted. I couldn't do much, you know, in, in addition to the side effect of all the medications. I had these patches on my hair, on my leg, and sore began in my lower extremities. And in effect, Chuck, I, I, I wasn't able to do what I wanted to do, you know. And could you imagine maybe... You have not experienced arthritic pain. Lifting a piece of paper, you cannot. I cannot. And what else can I do with that? Basically nothing. Mm. And I, I became so pathetic to myself because I couldn't do what I want to do. And then came in 
the savior, the plant-based diet. So I'm, I'm gladly enjoying my life now and my food. It's so wonderful to be here and talk about this. Let's talk about your food here. Let's get excited about that. That's the best part of the story, aside from the fact that you got your life back. Um, what does your diet look like today compared to what it had been the previous two decades? Oh, <laughs> you know, let, let me tell you the typical diet of uh, Dr. Ganu or the typical life of Dr. Ganu. Every morning by five o'clock, I am up. I do 6.2 kilometers walk, brisk walk every morning. And after that, I take a salad, a, f a bowl full of salad every morning. And, and, I, and, and this salad is mixed with so many vegetables and fruits, and I enjoy it. And then in the afternoon comes my heavy meal. My heavy meal is more of local food, but not processed, not polished, not refined. I never tasted since January, I never taste, I have never tasted refined, polished or, 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 or refined food. So uh, it's a local food and, and we, I, I, some of them are called um, fufu, banku. Fufu, for example, is made from plantain and cassava. And then yam, I don't know if you know some of this food, and corn made with many other food like banku. Banku is made from corn, and these are my heavy meals. In the evening, I usually don't eat, but I take in some fruits and if I have to. So that is my typical meal. But the best part I like is my salad, salad in the morning, and then my on polished, on refined food in the afternoon. Absolutely. And, and, and not only are you making me hungry, uh, you're making us healthier at the same time. Um, really quick, before we, we wrap things up, I think that, you know, it's important to note that you are also a professor of health. You have a doctorate, as a matter of fact, in preventative and lifestyle medicine, and uh, you are a published uh, researcher as well. Uh, you're the currently principal investigator for the African Health Study. Um, yes. How much of this information that you have learned now over the last year are you looking to share with the public at large? Are you looking at doing any sort of research or perhaps even opening a lifestyle medicine clinic uh, back home? I am thinking of returning back home to my home country, Ghana, to establish a center of influence for lifestyle management and research. It is time now to turn to Africa. You know, Africa still has those infectious diseases name them we have tuberculosis we have hiv AIDS, we have diarrhea but then we are adding the lifestyle diseases and those are double bedding and many people like me you know we, we are suffering innocently back home and my dream is to go back and establish a model center of influence which will be for the african continent and i'm working towards that very very um, energetically and very passionately. Hey, well, my friend, we are sending you all the well wishes to make that happen. If anybody has the will and the motivation to do it, I think that it is you. And uh, once again, thank you so very much for being here, my friend, and um, for sharing your incredible story with us. It's such a privilege to speak with you. How about wow. that, Dr. Newman? I mean, what what just an incredibly inspiring story. That was so uplifting, I have to say, to hear from somebody who has been a professor of public health their whole life, uh, being able to transform their day to day life in this powerful way is just beyond, beyond inspiring. I was I was really touched. And so now we move not only from a professor of public health, we also have a leading research fellow at King's College London joining us. She is um, Dr. Megan Rossi. She's an amazing expert on gut health and she's a registered dietitian and a nutritionist. And I've actually spoken to Dr. Rossi before. We've had a lovely conversation on a previous podcast and we've met in person. She is absolutely delightful and she knows all there is to know about gut health. But today she's gonna be talking to us about the blood type diet. So I can't wait to hear what she has to say about that, that very specific dietary trend. Today I want to touch on research behind the blood type diets. 
So you may have heard of it before, it actually came out around the 90s where some uh, researchers suggested that you should eat a certain way based on the type of blood that you have, whether you're a type A or type O, you should eat in a certain dietary pattern. So the researchers suggested the type A, uh, those people did best on plant-based diets, whereas people of type O did better on meat-heavy diets. Now, interestingly, this research was actually only published in a book, so it wasn't peer-reviewed. So since this has come out and it was really quite popular, a lot of researchers have gone through and more scrutinised the science behind this concept and this way of eating. Because we do certainly know that based on your blood type, you do have slightly different risk of heart disease. So there is some mechanism there. But in terms of whether we should be dictating our dietary patterns based on our blood types, we wanted to really, I guess, further explore that. And some researchers um, recently did that. So Bernard and colleagues published a really brilliant paper where they critically reviewed this. So what they did is they took a group of participants and they put them all on a plant only diet. So this essentially was the eating pattern that only type A should do good on. Um, type O's weren't meant to eat or weren't meant to get very good results when they followed this way of uh, eating. So what they did is they put the persons all on this way of eating for 16 weeks and then they reviewed the outcomes in terms of body weight, cholesterol levels, body fat, etc. And guess what they found? No difference in terms of benefit between those who had type A blood type, type O, or the other blood types. What they did find though, was something we see all the time, certainly I see in clinical practice, is that those who followed you know, this plant-heavy diet, they did lose significant amounts of weight. They also had better cholesterol profiles and better fat profiles. So we do know that eating more plants in your diet is really important, and you don't need to worry about the type of blood that you have. We know that for everyone, adding more plants into the diet can be really beneficial. And when I talk about plants, I want to highlight that it's not just things like your fruit and your veg. There is actually six different categories of plants, and we know that each different category is actually really important to include in our diet. So we have our whole grains, our nuts and our seeds, our fruit, our veg, our legumes, so beans and pulses, and herbs and your spices. Now, each different category, like I said, provides our bodies with different types of nutrients, as well as our gut bacteria. Remember, there's trillions of them in our gut, and a lot of the mechanisms of how these plant-based diet works is actually via our gut microbiome. So feeding them that diversity of fertilizer that comes from each of the groups is really thought to be the key to, you know, better heart health, mental health, skin health, etc. So I really love that the researchers actually wanted to critically appraise this research and review whether actually we should be eating according to our blood types. And the research says we shouldn't. Add more plants into your diet and you'll be doing a lot of good for your health. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much to Dr. Rossi there for sharing her expertise and the information that she did. I'm really glad that we're having this conversation around so many different kinds of dietary patterns. And I know that you, Chuck, earlier talked about some of the kooky diets that you tried. I think it's so important, isn't it, to kind of get back to the basics, right, Chuck? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it really does. It comes down to, you know, kind of what your mom and your dad told you growing up, eat your fruits and eat your vegetables. And we can get really, you know, deep into the science of everything. But if you just focus on eating those things and throwing in some whole grains and some legumes, you're going to be in, in a perfect space. Like, you know, I was thinking that uh, they didn't call it keto at the time. Um, it was more Atkins. Like I, I did one of those, like a bacon diet. I did one of those. I I did um, general low carb. I did all kinds of things, the cookie diet, like whatever the case may be. It's so confusing when you have so many diets out there and it's almost overwhelming. And I think that really the hardest part for a lot of people is figuring out how in the world to even get started. You know, what is the first step that you, you need to take in order to change to a healthy diet and have the confidence as you're making that change, Dr. Newman, that you're changing to the diet so you don't have to diet anymore. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point because it's all about being able to sustain a lifestyle choice, one that you can enjoy, one that you can do day to day forever so that it's not just a diet in the sense of, OK, this is a short term intervention for a period of weeks and then I'm going to go back to doing what I did before, uh, which I think a lot of people end up doing. Um, and I think when it, when it comes to things like low carb diets, I'm really glad that we talked to uh, Dr. Nagra a little bit and hopefully he'll come back now and share a bit more because, you know, there is research on low carb diets to show that it can improve weight loss like many things um, and people with diabetes they can reduce their medication however you know we don't have evidence that it improves insulin resistance or improves beta cell function and in the long term we certainly don't have that year on year data in humans to show that it's beneficial as compared to plant-based diets uh, what are your thoughts on that Matthew yeah actually I'm glad you asked that because something I didn't uh, mention earlier was there was actually a metabolic ward trial uh, about a year and a half, two years ago now. And what this is, is they had participants volunteer, or, or perhaps they got paid to participate, I'm not quite sure, but to live in a hospital for a month. And they did two weeks of a low-fat plant-based diet. They could eat all they wanted. And then they switched to two weeks of a keto diet where, again, they could eat all they wanted. And there was an emphasis on those more animal-based foods as well. And then they swapped. Uh, so, so both groups did both diets. And they found that both at the end of those two week periods resulted in a similar weight loss, but the plant-based diet group are the ones who actually lost more body fat. The keto group, they had their body weight drop off quicker, but it tends to be um, fat free mass, which is more like water weight and, and potentially even muscle mass. So we see even from a weight loss perspective, if you're allowed to just go to town, eat as much as you want, a more fiber rich kind of plant-based diet might even be preferable there. Now, in, you know, as far as blood sugar levels, they actually both had similar uh, results there. Uh, yeah, the keto group didn't improve insulin resistance to the degree that the plant-based group did uh, based on what are called uh, glucose tolerance tests. Uh, but that's kind of expected with keto. When you're in a ketogenic state, your body goes into insulin resistance because you're trying to burn fat versus carbohydrates. You need to maintain the little bit of carbohydrates you have in your bloodstream. So you're not going to be you know, insulin sensitive and using all that up. So, um, so the results were really expected in that sense. And, and, uh, again, when it came to weight loss, both groups did very similarly with the plant-based group, uh, edging out the fat loss side of things. Dr. Bernard, I, I want to ask you this question here, cause we, we can talk about science all day, but I know that really for a lot of us, it's also going to boil down to, you know, I, I guess I just don't know how to get started, especially with a plant-based diet, right? So when you're speaking to somebody and they come to you, they say, I could never go vegan. It's just too restrictive. What advice might you offer them? Well, we've seen this a lot in our research studies and also here at Barnard Medical Center. Uh, the step one is just to take a minute or two to understand why we're doing it. It's not rocket science. People can understand how eating a high fiber, low fat diet is gonna cause weight loss. But then we break the actual process of change into two steps. Step one, take about seven days, not starting the diet, but thinking about the foods you would eat if you were eating a completely vegan diet. So, okay, oatmeal, maybe with berries or sliced bananas or sliced strawberries or something like that, fair enough. Um, I could have pancakes, but without the butter. When I have pizza in the evening, no cheese. Okay, so, so the person's taking a week and they're thinking about the foods they could have, they make a list and they involve their partner, spouse, family in, in this. So we're all gonna do it together. After seven days, everyone's got a br brilliant list. Then step two, take three weeks, jump in, but it's only three weeks. So you can, you can do vegan for three weeks easily and you've already got your list. So now it seems really, really approachable. And at the end of that time, people are sold. They're seeing weight loss, but their tastes are gravitating toward healthier foods. So short-term focus, that's what really gets it done. Oh, that's wonderful. And I know that Dr. Nagra, you also have your own practice. You, you help people make dietary changes day in, day out. Do you have any top tips for, for people moving forward after they listen to this, they're feeling pumped, they're feeling excited. What are your top tips for them as they move forward? I mean, I, I think Dr. Bernard's advice was, was really good. And, and um, I tend to take kind of a slow burn approach as well. Uh, one of the things I like to advise is like, let's start one meal at a time. So, you know, for the next two, maybe two and a half, three weeks, however long really you want to set it, let's work on breakfast. 
you know, let's try things like whole wheat toast with nut butter and some berries. Let's try oatmeal, as, as Dr. Bernard mentioned. Let's try it if you want something a little more elaborate, a tofu scramble. And we'll mix around with these few different recipes for that period of time until it becomes more habitual. Once you've built sort of a habit out of that and it's easy to do, then let's move on to lunch. Do the same sort of thing. Then let's move on to dinner. And I think that helps build longer term success, although it takes maybe a few months to actually get to that end point versus trying to make the overnight switch and perhaps you know falling off because it's a little too difficult. And you know what? I, wa I want to ask uh, Dr. Ganu about this because this is something that you have done relatively recently, my friend, uh, and, and just had gangbuster style results here. What kind of tips can you offer us as far as making that transition and finding what's going to work for you? Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's all about motivation. And for me, it's all it's about motivation. Um, and and it's in the brain, in the mind. If if you if you set your mind on what you want to do and you have that motivation. My motivation was I had a problem. I need to find a solution for it. And I found what works for me. And so for me, uh, I don't need research. I don't need anybody. I am so much motivated because something has practically worked for me. And uh, my, my advice is that it calls for discipline and self-control as well, you know. So, uh, and, and if you want to do it, you can do it. You just have to discipline yourself like uh, Dr. Bernard and uh, others have said, you take it slowly, one um, little at a time. And I believe with a high level of motivation and a high level of, yes, we can, I can do it, we can all practice plant-based diet. There it is. I think that that sums it up perfectly, you know, and that, that was very much my experience as well. If you want to do it, you mm -hmm. can do it. Can. Very, very, very much words of wisdom there, my friend. Thank you so very much for joining us today, uh, everybody. And and Dr. Newman, what an insightful show we just had. I mean, that was that was a pretty good analysis of all different kinds of diets out there. It really was. I've got to say, I've thoroughly enjoyed that. It was like a whistle-stop tour of all sorts of things. And at the end of the day, what do we come back to? It's all about those plants. <laughs> that's it. That's it. The one healthy world right there. Whistle-stop tour. I'm, I'm assuming that that's a, a British term that I'm not too familiar with. I love yes. that. Yes. <laughs> it, means, it means we did a little bit of everything and we uh, and we had a good time. Whistle stop. I love it. You never stop learning. <laughs> oh, thank you all so very much for being here today. Oh, man, this has just been absolutely fantastic. Dr. Newman, can't wait to do this again. Thank you all for tuning in to One Healthy World. Thanks, everyone.